Rico Omar Harris, known to the world of basketball and all who followed his career as simply Rico, was an extroverted, athletic, and one-time world-renowned basketball prodigy. His energetic, entertaining skill set, followed by a courageous battle against addiction and apparent recovery, was cut short by an unexplainable, untraceable vanishing in October of 2014, leaving all who knew him, from college basketball fans in Los Angeles to the Harlem Globetrotters, grasping for answers in a sea of evidence that drowned us all in doubt. As a hope to provide more substantial reasoning built upon observable evidence and situational analysis, this is an examination of the disappearance of Rico Harris and the mystery in Yolo Country and the surrounding hills of Cache Creek. This is Cold Case Detective. Rico Harris was born on May 19, 1977, to parents Henry Harris and Margaret Fernandez in Los Angeles, California. After moving to Oregon for a little while to account for Henry's new job, the Harris family quickly bonded with one another, but moved back to Los Angeles soon after to raise three additional children. During their younger years, the Harris siblings were subjected to violent and abusive tendencies at the hands of their father. Rico specifically was a frequent target of Henry's rage taking the brunt of his abuse, despite desperately seeking out his approval as he grew into a teenager. Henry's collision course eventually drove Margaret away, and she took her children with her to Alhambra, California. Rico, the eldest brother, took it upon himself to help support the family, and while Margaret would work full-time, he watched over his siblings. While his parents urged him to use his big body frame in sports, Rico decided to pursue acting at age 15. To improve his chances of finding success, he enrolled in Hollywood High School, a headache of a drive all the way from Alhambra. However, these aspirations only lasted a year before Rico realized he was born to play basketball and used his father's address to attend Temple City High School. By the time he was 16 years old, Rico was already 6 feet 8 inches tall and 250 pounds, a colossal of a young man. It didn't take long for him to take control of the basketball court, dominating his opponents and entertaining the crowds with his explosive style of play. He transformed a once dormant high school club into a powerhouse program, drawing in college scouts as he reflected the style of Magic Johnson and broke through double team defenses. Off the court, he was an introverted adolescent without much academic prowess, until he met a girlfriend whose family helped him achieve higher grades in school. This helped Rico find even more success in basketball, and during his senior season, he averaged 28 points, 15 rebounds, and was compared to the top basketball recruits in Western United States, such as Jason Terry and Paul Pierce. Sadly, because Rico failed to receive high marks on the SAT, his scholarship offers from top flight universities, such as UCLA, were rescinded. Thus, Rico ended up at Arizona State to take classes before regaining eligibility to play basketball. For the first time in his life, Rico was away from friends and his close-knit family, and it caused struggles in his studies and his social life. In March of 1996, he was briefly accused of unlawful imprisonment along with two other teammates, but the charges were dropped and Rico was told he had to sit out a second year of sports in order to clean up his act. Refusing to sacrifice additional precious time, Rico transferred to Los Angeles City College. He was able to join the basketball team and immediately let his presence be known. He guided the LACC clubs to a state title and won most valuable player. But by his second year, Rico found himself in academic decline and trending towards an unhealthy lifestyle, constantly consuming alcohol despite still performing at a high level on the basketball court. When he lost connection to his former girlfriend and acknowledged his deteriorating emotional health, Rico shut down his recruitment from other colleges, fearing they only wanted his skills rather than his personal development, and declared for the NBA draft. Once again though, this plan went up in flames when Rico kept pushing off special events to showcase his skills 
in order to remain close to home. As a byproduct, he withdrew his name from draft consideration, declining various East Coast offers to play Division I college ball and transferred to Cal State Northridge. Many thought it was a poor choice for Rico's future career, and the doubters were unfortunately correct. Over the summer between semesters, Rico attempted to reconcile with his estranged father, Henry, but was swiftly rejected. Caught in a purgatory of social and emotional negligence, Rico continued to lose focus and lost interest in the NBA during his only lackluster season at CS Northridge. Out of NCAA eligibility, Rico turned to semi-professional basketball to keep his NBA dream alive. He played in San Diego, St. Louis, and other pickup teams, before deciding to join the Harlem Globetrotters, a comedic exhibition basketball team. In a tragic twist, Rico found himself in a scuffle in South LA only a month into the Globetrotters gig, in which he was hit in the back of his head by a baseball bat. While he survived, Rico suffered from balance issues and headaches thereafter, effectively ending his basketball career. After moving back to Alhambra with his mother and siblings, Rico entered a seven-year stretch of battling addiction that started with alcohol and soon exploded into heroin, meth, and cocaine. In fact, all of the Harris siblings were suffering from some version of substance abuse, and their mother Margaret did everything she could to help them with their demons. After Rico turned 30 years old in 2007, he finally sought true help and entered rehab. The program lasted longer than normal, but in the end, Rico recovered from his addiction. In 2012, he met Jennifer Song, a Seattle insurance broker, and the two entered a romantic relationship. Throughout the next couple of years, Jennifer and Rico became very close. Rico eventually moved to Seattle permanently and started planning a life with Jennifer as a married couple. The two talked about having children and setting up a happy future. Rico even lined up a job interview as a property appraiser, an incredible opportunity considering all he had to overcome. However, before Rico could make the final transformation, he had to go back home to Alhambra one more time to find closure with his family. He arrived on October the 9th, 2014, and had dinner with his brother, gifting him a new cell phone. Rico then visited his mother, engaged in a one-on-one -on -one private conversation. Whatever resulted in the exchange is unknown, but is believed to have been against Rico's wishes. Rico left for Seattle again just after midnight and stopped in Lodi, California for gas. He drove all night and in the morning called Jennifer to let her know he was going up into the mountains to rest. It was the final point of contact anyone made with Rico Harris, and he soon disappeared into the North Sacramento wilderness. In early September of 2014, Rico and his girlfriend Jennifer enjoy their intimate, hopeful relationship with one another and begin to think about the future together. However, Jennifer notices something is off with Rico, who acts abnormally and loses his sense of organization. After she persists in questioning him, Rico reveals he elapsed the previous summer of 2014 with alcohol consumption. While it hadn't turned back into a habit, the return to an old behavior threw Jennifer off balance. Rico's relapse is confirmed by longtime friend David Laura, who had rekindled their friendship around the same time. Later in September, despite the earlier friction, Rico and Jennifer settled on taking their relationship a step further and move in together in Seattle, Washington. It's seen as a monumental endeavor for Rico, who previously struggled when away from his hometown of Los Angeles and close-knit family. The couple engage in intense conversations about marriage, having children, and exploring true love. Yet Rico still feels insecure about the new surroundings. It takes him almost a month to unpack as Rico felt awkward making himself at home in a living space that wasn't his own. Jennifer later says it was Rico's sensitive, underlying will to provide for loved ones that fed the insecurity and not lingering second thoughts or laziness. Within the first week of October, things change for the better. Rico secures a job interview for a position as a property appraiser at a local real estate company. The new opportunity sparks joy and encouragement, and Rico finally unpacks his belongings in Jennifer's house, a signal he's ready for change and is there to stay in Seattle. The happy vibes shifted unexpectedly on October the 8th, 2014, when Rico tells Jennifer he's going out later in the day to explore. 
a bit strange compared to Rico's usual activity. Yet Jennifer doesn't really think twice about it and kisses her fiance goodbye. But when Jennifer calls Rico later in the eve of October the 8th, Rico informs her that he's on his way to Los Angeles to visit with his family. Rico explains that he wants closure from the dark past of his childhood and to create trust with his mother again regarding their relationship and his future. Jennifer, while taken aback, understands his well meanings and supports his quick decision. Jennifer remembers Rico sounding excited to move on, his head seemingly in the right space. Rico arrives in Alhambra the next day on October the 9th. His mother, Margaret, notes his excitement about the recent changes and optimism about his flourishing life. However, Margaret also suspects Rico to have been drinking or under the influence of a substance. In the evening of October the 9th, Rico leaves his mother's house and has dinner with one of his younger brothers. He buys his brother a new cell phone and the two reminisce of old times. After the brothers rekindling, Rico heads back to Margaret's house in Alhambra to engage in a private conversation and again the closure he seeks from a tattered childhood. The conversation does not last long and Margaret later claims she felt Rico hadn't taken from the conversation what he had hoped for in terms of emotional revelation. Not long after the clock strikes midnight, on Friday, October the 10th, Rico decided to head back to Seattle rather than spending the night like his mother expected in order to have extra prep time for his interview. He takes a few extra personal belongings from his mother's home and hits the road. At around one o'clock, Rico calls his mother again to explain his rash decision. Margaret recalls his son saying something along the lines of, I have these things that I need to do. Right after talking to his mother, Rico then calls Jennifer, once again surprising her with the premature return home. The couple talks for three to four hours, throughout which Jennifer encourages Rico to find a motel and sleep, considering he had been awake for 40 plus hours. Rico finally comes around, but offers the desire to drive up to the nearby mountains for a quick nap. Jennifer suggests an alternative, reminding him he'd have no cell service at high altitude and the dark, winding roads would be dangerous in the thick of night. The two end their phone call, with Rico still set on driving. At 8am on October the 10th, Rico receives a second call from Jennifer after she slept for a few hours. Rico informs her that he's getting gas at a station near Sacramento in a town called Lodi, California. He sounds incredibly tired from his end of the phone. An hour or so later, Rico is contacted again, this time by his mother, wondering about his progress. Rico finally admits to his exhaustion and claims he's going to find somewhere to rest and eat. Throughout the morning, both Jennifer and Margaret make multiple calls to Rico to check in on his resting plans, but Rico never picks up. After a few unsuccessful tries, Jennifer sends him a text. At 10.44 a.m., Rico finally responds to Jennifer's text and says he's doing well, but gives little details. This is the last official contact anyone makes with Rico Harris. As morning shifts to the afternoon, Jennifer tries to let Rico's rest time go uninterrupted. Yet her anxieties get the best of her and she calls him anyway, still getting no response. Jennifer tells herself he must still be in the mountainous region of California and the cell service is playing a role. Between 7 and 8 p.m., Jennifer officially falls under the silence of Rico and calls Margaret, worried. Margaret, on the other hand, is calm and guesses Rico is just operating on his own will, not uncommon to his personality. Sometime before midnight, Rico records himself singing along to music in his parked car, but he appears to be doing so unintentionally. He also throws around various CDs from the passenger compartment as well. These video clips are later found to be timestamped on the evening of October the 10th, confirming he was alive and functioning at that time. At 11.15, Rico's cell phone turns off. Whether it was by Rico himself or due to battery failure is unknown. The weekend of October the 11th and 12th goes by and Rico never returns any calls or returns to Seattle. Yet Jennifer and Margaret hold off on reporting it, remembering he once escaped to San Diego for a few hours without notice and give him a couple days to reappear. On Monday, October the 13th, a Yolo County Deputy Sheriff makes a routine check of an isolated rest area parking lot at Rumsey Canyon in Rumsey, California, along California State Route 16. 
He finds a black Nissan Maxima off to the side in the dirt lot with no nearby passengers, but lets it be. The following day, on Tuesday, October the 14th, the same Yolo County Sheriff returns to his route and finds the Nissan in the same spot in the parking lot. He runs the plate in his database and discovers it belongs to Rico Harris, his address still linked in Alhambra. The Yolo County Sheriff's office calls Margaret to inform her they found the car but no person, and she then calls Jennifer. Trying to make sense of what both women described as a surreal dream, Margaret officially files a missing persons report with the Alhambra Police Department and law enforcement opens an investigation. Over the next week or so, police put together a vast network of searches and rescue personnel. Helicopters with thermographic cameras fly over the surrounding areas. All-terrain vehicles are commissioned for the mountainous search zone and cadaver dogs are deployed to pick up any lingering scent of Rico. Overall, the crews covered a five mile radius of the parking lot and 27 mile stretch of Rumsey Canyon along Route 16, but find little clues besides unidentified footprints in the dirt alongside the road. Using cell phone data, police interview residents of nearby locales and receive a few reassuring sightings that dated back to Sunday, October 12th but nothing concrete surfaces. On October the 19th, investigators receive another tip about the sighting of a large man walking along Route 16 and subsequent shoe prints are found in the dirt once again. However, the location of the previous eyewitness testimonies and footprints compared to the October 19th clues lead police to conclude Rico had left the site of his car at Rumsey Canyon, walked along the Cache Creek and then returned to the original spot for unknown reasons. This revelation would provide the strongest foundation for later theories. A few days later on October the 22nd, the search is pulled back and slowly dwindles down. In mid-November of 2014, divers return to deeper sections of the surrounding bodies of water to record more searches, but again find nothing of use or suspicion. Since the mid-October mystery, nobody has found credible evidence to lead police to answers or spark reasonable theories outside of speculation. Currently, we are only left with what was found in those few weeks of investigating, making the entire ordeal murky with dead ends and puzzle pieces without a home. In the case of the disappearance of Rico Harris, most of the tangible clues were discovered in the first week or so of searches but none was more perplexing than the backpack and cell phone recovered on a guardrail along Route 16 near Cache Creek. After police assessed cell phone records from the provider company, data pings led them to the Redwood Valley area in Northern California, about 70 miles northwest from where Rico's vehicle was originally located. To cover all their bases, authorities called as many residents as they could in the surrounding communities, leaving messages on voicemails asking for tips. It didn't take long for the scheme to produce results when lead investigator Dean Nyland received a call from a Redwood Valley man who claimed to have found items belonging to Rico. Police immediately responded to the tip and learned the Redwood man indeed had a black book bag owned by Rico Harris. Inside the backpack were jumper cables and his cell phone. The man explained he, his wife and their grandson were driving along Route 16 when the young boy alerted his grandparents that the stray backpack was on the curb of the highway and alarmingly out of place amid the surroundings. The man pulled over and the trio shouted into the wilderness to hopefully make contact with the bag's owner. When they found nobody down by the creek, the Redwood family checked the bag for ID. All they found were the cables and phone, so they took it with them in hopes to charge it and contact someone. Law enforcement quickly assumed the backpack to be Rico's not only was the bag like a purse, according to Jennifer, who recognized the parcel instantly, but was also found only 1,500 feet from a sighting reported by a passerby earlier in the week. Someone who had seen a large African-American man standing along the guardrail on Route 16. These inclinations were confirmed when the officers assessed the cell phone and combed through its information. Pulled from the phone would later prove to be crucial visual evidence in creating the timeline of Rico's last known actions. In his media gallery, Rico had videos of himself singing along to music in his car, 
but seemingly ignorant to the fact that he was recording himself. Along with absent-minded singing, Rico was also seen throwing around CDs in the cabin, ripping up random papers, and playing with the sunroof controls. These clips were saved in the evening hours of October the 10th, meaning Rico was alive that night, and probably showcased the reason why the vehicle was out of gas and had a dead battery. The fact that Rico had been tossing items around in the car also helped explain why the car had originally appeared ransacked when investigators towed it into the station. Most importantly, however, the cell phone videos gave authorities a better idea about the state of mind Rico was in around the time he last made contact with his family. The fact that Rico recently relapsed with drug use was thought to have consumed alcohol while in Alhambra, engaged in difficult, emotionally draining conversations with his family, and was awake for an estimated 50 hours straight, would certainly lead to a fragile psyche. This combined with Rico's indecisive demeanour and lifetimes worth of personal struggles could have tripped him into madness, or at least extreme exhaustion. Without a doubt, the backpack, cell phone, and overall major case point shows Rico was in trouble, and if not from a third party, then at least from his own beaten, battered self. The first and most popular discussed theory in the case of Rico Harris developed into a confusing, speculative story of foul play. The hypothesis originated with the Yolo County Sheriff's Department after the Nissan was found abandoned and seemingly plundered. Besides the mess of papers, CDs, and bottles in the back seat, investigators also noted Rico's wallet was left behind, still full of its contents, except for a discovery credit card. On the exterior, the car wasn't parked in any of the marked parking slots and had both no gas and a dead battery. Police calculated that after filling up with gas in Lodi, California, Rico took a wrong turn and headed northeast on Route 16, when he found the Cache Creek Park in Rumsey Canyon, he pulled off to rest, released pent-up energy, and was eventually embattened with a third party. To explain the defects of the car, investigators guessed the gas must have been siphoned. This theory would also explain why a 6 foot 8 300 pound man could so easily slip through the cracks outside of a few potential sightings. Men of that size typically don't go away unnoticed unless another person or persons assist them drives them away, or something far sinister. The foul play musings became much more obscure when Rico's backpack and footprints were discovered, because the cell phone videos show Rico sitting in an idle car on October 10th. It's possible he ran out of gas and juiced the battery from extended periods of running both the engine and the audio system. Normal cars can run through one fifth gallons of gas per hour just in idle position so it's in the realm of possibility that Rico let his car run through the night of the 10th and into the weekend of October the 11th and 12th. It would also help explain why the interior of the car was a wreck and why jumper cables were in Rico's possession. He was probably looking for someone to help jump his battery, meaning the footprints along Route 16 suggested Rico walked along the highway to flag down passers-by. There was also zero DNA findings to corroborate third-party interference or the presence of a stranger. So while Rico certainly didn't encounter foul play whilst in his car at Cache Creek, investigators still theorize he met with trouble after hitchhiking along Route 16. They believe while walking and talking to anyone who would pull over to assist him, Rico was taken advantage of by someone or somebody with criminal intentions. It's very likely Rico was not in the right frame of mind that weekend, and if he came across as exhausted or groggy, his captor could easily persuade him to leave his backpack behind and get in the vehicle. It's a bit confusing as to why someone would risk dealing with a man who is almost guaranteed to have a physical advantage, not to mention no money on their person. But it's also worth remembering, Rico relapsed shortly before his disappearance, and if he found someone who promised him drugs or other substances, how likely would he have been persuaded? Who this figure could be ranges from a potential killer to a drug dealer to someone desperate for a man of Rico's stature. Unfortunately, there are hardly any leads or threads associated with the foul play theory, besides combing through people with criminal backgrounds in the area. Due to the vast population of Northern California and the Sacramento area, the possibilities are borderline infinite. Another theory considered by many is that Rico was wounded and taken by a wild animal or large predator. 
Northern California has its fair share of wildlife, including combative creatures such as rattlesnakes, mountain lions, and black bears. A rattlesnake would certainly be able to bite and poison an unsuspecting human, but if Rico was in fact bit by a snake, his body would have been picked up by the overhead helicopters or numerous search parties. Black bears, while imposing animals, are in fact quite docile and do not interact with humans very often let alone a large man the size of somebody like Rico. The only animal that makes sense is a mountain lion, yet it would take a considerably strong cougar or pack of cougars to kill Rico, and then take his body into a dwelling, cave, or habitat hidden from humans. The search found no blood or signs of struggle in the dusty expanse of Rumsey Canyon, and again the mere size of Rico probably deterred wild animals from approaching. And if he did die somewhere in the wilderness, his body would not have decayed into the ground and avoided visibility due to the timeline of the disappearance and impending manhunt. The third theory associated with Rico involved around a planned escape and manufactured disappearance. This conspiracy points to Rico's history with indecision and probable disappointment with the closure he sought when returning to Alhambra. Supporters of the story suggest that Rico realized in his return home he no longer wanted the life he hoped for in Seattle, and thought best to vanish without a trace and escape somewhere new. The theory points to the new cell phone Rico bought for his brother, highlighting that Rico could have bought a second phone that he used for his getaway, and that his brother helped him along the way. After the conversation with his mother went south, Rico decided to leave unnoticed, using his scheduled interview as an excuse. On the way to Sacramento, Rico slowly broke off contact with his mother and girlfriend, and veered off course from Interstate 5 to Seattle, and drove east to Cache Creek. When he arrived, he recorded himself to appear distressed and potentially even stage a kidnapping or robbery. After the car finally ran out of gas and electricity, Rico walked off with his backpack and old phone, appearing to need help with his jumper cables. Instead, when Rico flagged down a car to hitchhike, he left the bag and cell phone behind to create a diversion. Some go as far to say whoever picked him up was in on his plan and a link to Rico's stage disappearance and his new life. In the end, this theory is rife with inconsistencies. Rico had been adamant to all he knew that the opportunities in Seattle were incredibly encouraging. He had recently become a resident of Washington State, constantly talked about marriage and fatherhood, and truly settled in with Jennifer. Police also tracked the missing discovery credit card found missing from Rico's wallet and the account was never assessed or operated at any time following October the 10th, meaning that if Rico escaped, the funds he would most certainly need to execute such a scheme came elsewhere and not from personal wealth. Taking into consideration the skill and resourcefulness needed to pull off such a feat, the improbability of faking a mental collapse seen in the selfie videos, and coincidental contrast of Rico's recent attitudes towards life, the idea that Rico staged his disappearance and escaped thereafter is highly implausible. Before we divulge our hypothesis of Rico's mysterious disappearance, we want to make known our conclusions presented in Cold Case Detective are purely logical speculation based on evidence, circumstance, and factual subtext. We are only privy to the same information presented in each video, and we do not attempt to promise certain or an expert guarantee on the findings we reach in the closing. We simply observe, research, and report. In this case, we believe Rico continued to relapse into substance abuse as the result of personal torment and extreme exhaustion. Found himself alone and free of scrutiny out in the wild after making a wrong turn on his journey, and wandered into unknown territory where he most likely died, hidden by the natural elements. All of his life, Rico dealt with the absence of a caring, nurturing father. Despite the physical and verbal abuse he sustained in his youth, Rico sought his father's approval and internalized his love for basketball. After he and his siblings moved in with their mother, Rico never quite broke off the relationship he had with Henry Harris. When Rico's basketball career fizzled out and he turned to drugs and alcohol, Rico swelled the bubbling tension from a rough childhood. To make matters more complicated, Rico ran into his own father in jail after an arrest for public intoxication. These humiliations and unresolved conflicts took a psychological toll on Rico, leaving him with signs of undiagnosed depression, anxiety, and possibly bipolar disorder. 
revealed by Jennifer after he disappeared. Taking a history of mental troubles into consideration, a relapse into substance use, and family or shortcomings would have put Rico in a very dark place on his drive back to Seattle. After his attempts to tie knots on his past fell short and failure created the wounds in his heart and mind to irreversible sizes. Thus, after staying awake for more than two consecutive days, the emotional instability caught up to Rico and he ventured from the planned course. On his drive up north, he probably took a wrong turn that took him through the mountains of northern Sacramento and into Rumsey Canyon. Between the stop for gas in Lodi and parking in the lower site of Cash Creek Park, Rico found an outlet for drugs and alcohol and picked some up. Hard drugs are notoriously distributed throughout Sacramento and the surrounding regions, so it wouldn't be too tricky for a former addict to navigate and purchase. After he parked, Rico either consumed the drugs he had collected or experienced the side effects in full force. It's plausible he had taken either crack or methamphetamines throughout the trip anyways, stimulants that explain how he could stay awake and alert for so long. The drug reasoning comes from a vital clue found in the Nissan Maxima after police towed the vehicle into evidence. Under the glove compartment below the passenger seat, investigators discovered a bindle, a plastic wrap used specifically for drugs. Now the bindle in question was empty and contained no residue or drug paraphernalia, but hinted at a recent inclination towards substance use. There were also two bottles of alcohol found, one empty and the other half full, also thought to be consumed by Rico. After the car ran out of power and gas, Rico wandered off from the lower site along the guardrail on the highway. He set his backpack and cell phone on the curb and walked down to the actual creek for a drink and cool down, where enormous footprints were found days later by the search teams. After spending time by the water, Rico found an easier way up the hill back to the road, a different place than where he'd left his belongings. While continuing to plod along Route 16, Rico was able to hitchhike and find a way into a small town or establishment where he could clean up and find something to eat. A couple vagrants in Clear Lake, California have said they recognized Rico buying drugs in the area once, but didn't have any details or further information regarding their testimony. The last part of this theory is quite cloudy. What Rico engages with throughout the next week is a complete mystery, but he avoids eyewitnesses and returns to the lower site in Rumsey Canyon where his car was parked on October the 19th. It was this night when someone reported sighting a large African-American male walking in that direction, and police later confirmed it with more footprints in the immediate area. Rico was probably dropped off so that he could return to his car, but when he found it was hauled away, he either went back to the vehicle that dropped him off or decided to stick around the newfound freedom and march into the woods. What happened afterwards is the true meat of the mystery, as mentioned previously, Rico was hard to miss and his profile didn't allow for much invisibility. Maybe he tripped into a sinkhole or ravine that camouflaged him from search and rescue. Maybe he took his own life in a deep part of the rugged forests. Regardless of details, Rico Harris was dealing with issues none of us can fathom or ignore. Whether it was a lack of sleep, a depressive episode triggered from recent events, or a combination of anxiety and drug use, Rico wasn't in his normal state of mind. His reckless activity in the cell phone videos proves just as much and unfortunately casts a heavy shadow of unpredictable behavior that stemmed afterwards. The Harris family and Rico's close friends have often talked about Rico's history with drugs and addiction to have stigmatized his character and undermined the public perception of the case. We want to be perfectly clear, Rico's struggles with substances does not take away from the compassionate and caring person he was he deserves just as much attention as any missing person and is not any more of a bad guy than you or I. Addiction stigma be damned. Addiction is a disease of mind and body and can create turmoil of both physical and emotional health. Those who struggle with addiction must battle not only their own sickness, but the constant degradation of society and those who categorize addicted persons as failures to the consequences of their actions. Rico Harris deserves to be found. He was a warrior, a courageous spirit that endured so much pain throughout his life. He finally found the light at the end of the tunnel, the dawn breaking from a treacherous night. He loved his family, he loved his friends, and he loved making a difference in people's lives. Outside of his athletic giftedness, Rico was a kind soul. He would have gone unthinkable distances to help those in need, so it's only fitting we do the same in his favor. 
Let not his legacy be Harlem Globetrotter to druggie to missing person. Let his legacy be of caretaker to a fighter to a found and fostering father, his ultimate aspiration. If you have any information regarding the disappearance of Rico Harris, please contact Yolo County Sheriff's Office at 530-668-5280. This has been Cold Case Detective.